distinguished chief guest ramji raghavan founder and chairman of agastya international foundation members of the board of governors faculty and staff colleagues students alumni friends and members of the media a warm welcome to all of you on the 41st foundation day of the indian institute of management bangalore today we celebrate the accomplishments of our faculty staff alumni and students who bring honor to the institute and serve as our brand ambassadors in our mission to rise from one of india's best management schools to one of the world's leading management schools research is of central importance under the leadership of our previous directors professors pankaj chandra and devnath tirupathi we began building a stronger research environment and this is bearing fruit imb's business and management research was ranked number 1 in a study of indian universities and institutes conducted at stanford university in addition to publishing in leading academic journals many of our faculty are recognized for their expertise with awards and appointments to international and national panels i would like to provide just a couple of examples professor pulak ghosh has been appointed as member of the data privacy advisory group of Co of global pulse the united nations big data innovation initiative <laughs> professor damodaran was appointed to the un's high level international panel on biologic biological diversity Professor Ramadas Singh was honored with the Sir J C Bose Memorial Award by the Indian Science Monitor. <laughs> Professor Vedanathan has been appointed by the Ministry of Finance as a member of a committee to suggest ways to enhance credit to MSME. <laughs> and two of our doctoral students, Tarun Jain and Neha Advani, have been individually selected as winners of the POMS Emerging Economies Doctoral Student Awards. I would like to turn now to our international standing and linkages. The institute continues to enhance its international reputation. Ed Universal of Paris has ranked IIM Bangalore as the top management school in Central Asia for the seventh consecutive year. The Financial Times ranked IIM's executive postgraduate program in management, which we call the EPGP. at 68th in the world in the global mba rankings 2014 this is the first time that the epgp participated in the financial times rankings and we are proud of the recognition <laughs> imb was also ranked 53rd among the top 70 open executive education program providers in the financial times 2014 executive education rankings IMB is the only management school in the global network of advanced management which includes Yale, London School of Economics, INSEAD and other top management schools of the world. We entered into a formal in entered an agreement for exchange of faculty and students with the Ho Chi Minh National Academy Vietnam as part of the high level discussions between the Indian Prime Minister and Vietnam's General Secretary of the Communist Party. We also signed an agreement with Toulouse Business School France to create India's first executive general management program in aerospace and aviation management as a first step towards collaborating in teaching and research. We have sharpened our focus on increasing the global awareness of our students. Each year about 150 go abroad for internships and exchange programs. We have launched a program to introduce new international field courses. that will provide rich international exposure to another 100 students by taking them to Japan, Singapore and Dubai this December. We are embracing new technology that will dramatically change the delivery of education. IMB is India's first management school to join edX, the Harvard MIT joint venture for promoting massive open online courses or MOOCs as they are known. We plan to launch several MOOCs next summer to deliver education to a large global population 
and complement the learning we provide to our students on campus. This will eventually enable us to deliver management education to the less privileged segments in India, as well as customize our programs for targeted audiences. In addition to positioning ourselves as leaders in management education, we also focus on activities that address the country's social and environmental needs through entrepreneurship and social impact ventures. I am pleased to share the accomplishments in this area over the last 12 months. This year, the NS Raghavan Center for Entrepreneurial Learning at IIM Bangalore organized the first ever Alumni and Women Entrepreneurs Week Step Up and Scale Up Shattering Myths. This event focused on the opportunities and challenges for women entrepreneurs in India and attracted over 200 alumni. The Carbon Disclosure Project India, in association with Professor Joes, released the first ever report on ICT sector's role in climate change mitigation, covering the state of preparedness of the sector in addressing intensifying climate change. Professor Tilochan Shastri, founder trustee of the Association for Democratic Reforms, received the CNN IBN Indian of the Year 2013 Public Service Award. Our students continue to be closely engaged in serving society. Prayas, the social service initiative of the EPGM students, EPGP, uh, EPGPM students, hosted a free foot and eye camp for the underprivileged two days ago that drew scores of people from across Karnataka. The Kasna, the social service club, held a very successful blood donation camp in July held in association with Prayas and the Red Cross Society. The camp recorded a total of 173 blood donations, the highest in the history of Vikasana's camps. I have mentioned only a few of the many notable achievements this past year. I would like to acknowledge and appreciate the work of all the faculty, staff, alumni, and students who continue to make this institute a great place of learning and innovation. I would now like to introduce our chief guest. In keeping with our tradition of service-driven initiatives, we are privileged to have with us today Mr. Ramji Raghavan, the founder and chairman of Agastya International Foundation, the world's largest hands-on mobile science education program for economically disadvantaged children and rural teachers. Agastya seeks to transform primary and secondary education in India by bringing innovative science education to the doorsteps of the schools. Operating with a fleet of 100 mobile labs, 40 rural science centers, 45 lab on bikes, and a 172-acre creativity lab campus near Bangalore, Agastya has provided hands-on science education to over 5 million children and 200,000 teachers. Agastya has also pioneered many innovations, including mobile science, ecology, and art labs, young instructor leaders, children, to, children teaching children, and a creativity lab. Agastya's innovative Teka, Tekla bike project was one of the four winners of Google's 2013 Global Impact Award. Prior to starting Agastya in 1998, Mr. Raghavan worked as a senior executive in financial service organizations in the US, Europe, and the Caribbean. Mr. Raghavan completed his BA in economics from Delhi University and followed it with a postgraduate diploma in development studies from the International Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands and an MBA from London Business School. In addition to his work with Agastya, Mr. Raghavan is a member of the board of Vigyan Prasar, New Delhi, and the Karnataka State Innovation Council, an executive council member of the Visveswarya Industrial and Technological Museum. In 2009, Mr. Raghavan was elected a senior fellow by Ashoka, Innovators for the Public, and in 2011, he was conferred the People's Hero 
Award by the Confederation of Indian Industry Southern Zone. I have personally been inspired by the enormous impact that Agastya has had on, the, on opening the minds of children. As our chief guest at the 41st Foundation Day, please join me in welcoming Ramji Raghavan, who will talk about living and acting creatively. It's uh, truly an honor and privilege to be here today to address, address such an august audience. And, uh, you know, when I think back to the early days of Augustia, uh, which I and a number of other people started, uh, I couldn't have imagined that one day people at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore would be interested in knowing about our story. But I guess stranger things have happened. So once again, I'm very honored and thank you for your time. In uh, January 1882, Van Gogh, the uh, great post-impressionist uh, painter, in a letter to his brother Theo wrote, Drawing becomes more and more a passion with me, and it is a passion just like that of a sailor for the sea. Right? Van Gogh's art represented painting as music. Those are not just flowers in a vase. They're almost something cosmic said a critic about the sunflowers, one of Van Gogh's greatest paintings. So unlocking the creative potential of children, adults, and communities around the world, poor, rich, and downtrodden, is, I believe, one of the most important challenges of the 21st century. By the end of my speech, you should learn about the transformative power of curiosity and uh, see new ways of unlocking and unleashing your own creativity. So what makes you creative or innovative or a great problem solver? Is it something in your genes or a skill that you've learned over the years? In 1884, when Einstein was five years old, his father brought him a gift, a magnetic compass. The compass fascinated Einstein because whichever way he held it, it always pointed in the same direction. It was a momentous gift. Einstein remarked years later that it was the compass that made him wonder if there was an invisible force in the universe uh, behind everything that happened in the universe. Right? Now, I know what you're thinking. Do I have to be Einstein to be creative? So let's fast forward more than a century later to 2008. On a hot summer's day in rural India, place called Kuppam, not very far from where we are today, two village girls, Rani and Roja, one the daughter of a farmer and the other the daughter of a carpenter, sat under a tree to escape the sun. Sensible thing to do in the Indian summer, right? And the girls began to talk and Rani looked at Roja and said, you know Roja, do you ever wonder why you feel cool or cooler sitting in the shade of a tree? And Roja thought for a second, hmm, well, Maybe it has something to do with the fact that the leaves and branches of the tree shield us from the sun. And the girls continued talking some more until the aha question popped out. Would different leaves have different cooling effects? And that question became a project not surprisingly titled The Cooling Effect of Leaves. And working with uh, instructors from the Augustia Foundation, nine months later the girls won a prestigious Intel Iris National Science Award, competing with the best and brightest kids from across India, most of them from relatively well-heeled urban schools. Now, is the story of Rani and Roja an uncommon one? So let's go to North Karnataka. Sai and Pavitra, two rather poor children, used to go home to their village on their annual vacation, and they would see these Mountains of groundnut shells piled up. As you know, India is one of the largest producers of groundnuts in the world. And uh, they found it rather disturbing, you know, aesthetically not very pleasing. So they asked the question, can we make something useful out of these groundnut shells? So they went to their chemistry teacher and uh, mixed a lot of different compounds with the groundnut shells to create a paste. And that was the good news from which they would make paper. 
The bad news is the paste wouldn't hold together. It wasn't gluey enough. So the paper became very brittle. So they hit a brick wall. And Sai went home, rather disheartened, but still very curious. And he was observing his grandmother cooking his favorite dish, lady's finger. Right? And he noticed something. He found that it left behind a gluey residue. And that was his aha moment. And he thought, maybe I can use this to provide the glue to keep that paste together. And sure enough, it did. And they produced paper. Now, I wasn't even aware of this, although they'd been working with the Augustia instructors, until I saw a film about this, which interviewed them on the internet, made by the Deshpande Foundation, one of our supporters. And so did an entrepreneur involved in the groundnut business. So he came up to us and said, hey, I'd like to know the formula because, you know, maybe I can commercialize this. But that's a different story. And uh, we don't have time to go into that, but some other day. Since 2008, when Rani and Roja met and sat under that tree, hundreds of children have done fascinating projects that have produced really interesting and innovative insights and findings. And many of them have won awards and prizes in India and at the international level. So what do these stories tell you? <clears throat> I think they tell you the value of curiosity, the spirit of inquiry, the magic of wonder, the power of passion, staying with a problem until you've cracked it. Keynes wrote about Newton, that Newton's peculiar gift was his continuous concentrated introspection. His capacity to hold a problem in his mind continuously for weeks on end until he saw through it. You know, the rishis of old in India had tremendous mental energy. They would hold problems and ideas in their minds, not just for weeks, but months and even decades. In 1988, I was a banker living in New York. I happened to see a film on public broadcasting station, the PBS TV, called The Man Who Loved Numbers. It was about the mathematical genius Ramanujan. And I was fascinated and particularly moved by Janaki Ammal, Mrs. Ramanujan's wife, and her comments on her husband. A few weeks later, I went to Madras. I happened to mention the film to my uncle, and to my great surprise and delight, he said, would you like to meet Mrs. Ramanujan? I couldn't believe it. I said, sure. So about an hour later, I was led into this very modest living room in Triplicane in Madras, and was immediately drawn to a magnificent bust of Ramanujan's that had been made by an American sculptor, and I understand funded by a hundred mathematicians from around the world, that dominated the room. As we chatted, Mrs. Ramanujan, who was then 89 and hard of hearing, said in a very high-pitched voice, eyes full of tears, no one remembers my husband anymore. You're the first person, the first Indian, to come and see me in the last two years. The person before me was a math teacher, a Punjabi lady from England, who was teaching math and she wanted to tell the kids about Ramanujan. And she described Ramanujan's last days and said, uh, on his deathbed were pieces of paper strewn around with abstract mathematical formulae. Right? And then she added with a sense of wonder, for him it was just numbers, numbers and numbers. So for those of you who understand Tamil, she said, Kanak, Kanak, Kanak. That's all. Ramanujan's was an example, an astounding example, perhaps an extreme one of passion-based creativity. So why should being creative be important to you? Those of you who are going to step out of IMB and make careers for yourself in the world. Creativity has become the most desired trait among knowledge workers in the world today because creativity leads to new ideas. New ideas lead to inventions. Inventions can and often do lead to innovations. And that in turn leads to higher productivity and prosperity. So as you step out, you, the future leaders of India, 
you will need to demonstrate creativity in the face of complexity. Uh, we were chatting over a cup of tea when uh, Kiran Mazumdar mentioned how the Mangalyaan uh, uh, Mars Orbiter mission happened. A classic example of creativity in the face of complexity. That's the name of the game. You will need to build environments where creativity can flower and flourish. Right? And then, of course, the creative spirit, as the great sages, poets, and artists tell us, connect you to something beautiful and sacred, something beyond your narrow self and experience. It infuses you with a sense of spontaneity and gives you meaning and purpose in life. When someone asked J. Krishnamurti, why do you speak so much to public audiences around the world? He replied by saying, why does a flower bloom? Okay. So being creative is terribly important. About 15 years ago, I decided to come back to India and start the Agastya Foundation, and I had a dream of building a school for creative leaders uh, in the foothills of the Himalayas. And so I asked the question, what makes a country creative? Is it possible to raise the level of an ocean? Raise the level, the speed limit of creativity of a country? And as I didn't know the answer, I got a lot of smart people around me. Among them was P.K. Iyengar, the former chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, my father, K.V. Raghavan, who had chaired a number of companies, uh, the former principal of the Rishi Valley School, who had worked very closely with J. Krishnamurti, a lot of students from colleges and schools, teachers, educators, and business people. And we came up with a model. We said, look, you, the creative person, are a great observer. You tend to see much more than others do. You tend to hear much more than others do. You tend to feel more deeply than others do. You experience deep awareness, sometimes completely unbiased awareness, which allows new thoughts to germinate and grow. You have the capacity to integrate, assimilate, and associate different strands of information and knowledge, apparently unconnected stuff, and find those connections. You tinker, you explore, you experiment, and you have the ability to then apply your knowledge and ideas to produce something of value for yourself, uh, your family, your community, or society in general. So we said these are the sorts of skills that go into creativity. Actually, rather similar, if not identical, to the discovery skills that are talked about in the book, The Innovator's DNA. But I must add that we came up with this long before the book, right? So the question next was, can you learn these skills? Can you learn to be more observant, more aware? to connect the dots, to apply things, to produce things of value? And the answer was yes. So Iyengar said, look, Ramji, you're not a scientist, but I'll give you a hundred low-cost science experiments. And if I force you to go through those experiments, I guarantee you, you will raise your quality of observation. When you see a candle burn, you'll ask questions. What's actually burning? Or when you see a green leaf, you will know or you'll wonder, what makes a leaf green or the sky blue? So you can learn those skills. Now, you may not produce a Ramanujan, but you can create an environment that encourages the Ranis and Rojas of the world, and perhaps the Ramjis of this world, to express themselves and give shape to their ideas fearlessly. Right? But to be creative, you have to be curious, we said. That's the foundational skill. But to be curious, you have to be motivated to be curious. You have to have the passion, the urge to want to find out. There's a story of Chanakya, who was sitting in a village, very despondent, thinking, despite his great intelligence and sagacity, how come we haven't been able to beat our hated enemy, the Nanda king? And he was sitting there pondering his apparent mediocrity when he saw a little boy sit down to have his lunch. The mother served a plate full of very, very hot rice. The boy was so hungry that he went for it. He scooped a lump of rice from the center of the dish and put it in his mouth 
and screamed in horror because it scalded his tongue. So his mother was concerned and scolded him and said, You silly boy, don't you realize the rice is hottest at the center? You should start from the edge and work your way slowly to the center. And that was the aha moment that our man was waiting for. He realized, ah, the mistake that Chandragupta and I have been making is trying to attack the Nanda king at the center where he is the strongest. We will start at the edges and work our way to the center slowly. And they did. And the Mauryan Empire started. And it came to be known as the Rice Bowl Stratagem. Right? So, to be creative, you really have to observe things, simple things. And you must have that urge to be curious. Now, how do you make it happen, though? We understood, if you like, the theory of it. We had a model. How do you make it happen? And we said, look, hands-on experiential learning perhaps is the way to go. Because we were involved in education. We wanted to spark curiosity, nurture creativity among poor kids and teachers. And we said hands-on experiential learning because cognitive scientists tell you that the human brain on average retains in its long-term memory no more than 5% of a lecture. You probably won't remember more than 5% of what I say today, I guess. 10% of what you read. 50% of what you see and hear. 70% of what you discuss with someone. 80% of what you personally experience, good or bad, we can all relate to that. And over 90% of what you teach to others. So we said, look, the education system is focused on reading and lectures at best. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's focus on hands-on experiential learning. And hands-on experiential learning also builds your confidence and motivation. And over the years, we kind of realized that perhaps the answer to sparking curiosity and nurturing creativity might lie with a toy like this. You see it? So this is called the tippy top. The beauty about it, you leave it there and it sits on its bottom because that's where its center of gravity is. But you spin it. I can't demonstrate it here because it'll fall off. And at a certain speed and depending on the surface you spin it on, it unexpectedly tips over. Right? And you go, ah! Because it's unexpected or wow or are. Now that ah is very important. Because in that ah, it's rather like when you see something uh, beautiful or arresting or even disturbing, counterintuitive, you go, ah, right? When the mind is awakened, when your curiosity is triggered. So the first and most important element in learning, we said, is the ah effect. The second, we said, is after you see it tip over, you say, now how did that happen or why does it happen? And you start the process of inquiry and exploration. And if you're lucky and if you're persistent and all the rest of it, you have your aha moment. Like Sai or Einstein or Ramanujan or Chanakya. Or several aha moments. When things sort of fill the blanks or you learn something new in a different way or at the highest level you have a creative insight. The aha moment is the second most important thing. And the third, of course, is you must have fun doing whatever you're doing, right? And that's the ha-ha element. Because fun and humor remove fear and anxiety. Uh, they improve retention and improve performance. So if the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, were the stepping stone for education in the 20th century, I believe the three A's, a, aha, and ha-ha, are the stepping stones for creativity in the 21st century. It's easy. Infuse the three A's in education. In fact, into the way you live and act. And you will find you'll trigger uh, important behavioral shifts. The shift from yes to why. And why not? There's too much yesing in the system. Not enough whying and why notting. Right? The second is the shift from looking to observing, as I explained earlier. The third is the shift from being very passive to learning to explore. The fourth is the shift from being very 
textbook bound or internet bound to being more hands-on. And finally, the most important shift, the shift from fear to confidence. There's a lot of fear in our system, across schools, institutes, politics, everywhere. People are afraid to speak up and express themselves. I remember years ago visiting a village school, and I do that a lot. And I met the head teacher and asked her, what impact has Augustia had on your school? And she pointed me to a tall girl, Uma, who was standing under a tree. So I went up to Uma and asked Uma, Uma, you've been visiting our campus for several months now. Have we made any difference? Have you seen any change? And I thought she'd say, yes, I'm doing very well in my studies and getting high grades and all the rest of it. But she didn't say that. You know what she said? She looked at me and said, sir, I'm not afraid to speak anymore. Now, that was my ah, aha, and ha-ha moment. Right? I realized all of a sudden that the real value of all our hands-on experiential interventions was not so much in improving Umar's grades and unit test scores and all the rest of it, although it turned out she was doing very well in her studies and that that impact was happening, which was gratifying. The real value was in the precious opportunity it gave children like Uma to lift their self-belief and confidence, to bring about the shift that psychologists call from learned helplessness to learned optimism. Okay? So we realize that that's really the thing. And that's why the program that Sushil referred to, where we teach children to teach children, it's really a powerful way of bringing about that shift from learned helplessness to learned optimism. So curiosity is a wonderful thing, right? But as the world has shown you on numerous occasions, curiosity alone doesn't guarantee action. Confidence alone can lead to bad and sometimes disastrous action when it spills over into arrogance. But curiosity combined with confidence can lead you to strong and positive action. And when you combine curiosity and confidence with humanity, a sense of caring, a relationship with your environment that's deep and caring, you have right or creative action. I've talked about curiosity mostly in terms of the external world, in a, in a scientific sense or in a business sense. But there is equally the power of curiosity into the inner world, the science of the interior, if you like, or Adhyatma Vidya, as, as we call it in India. The sculptors of old in India would go through long periods of meditation which resulted in uh, spectacular and godly works of art, what Aurobindo called the uh, shift from spirit to form, right? On the 7th of June, most of you would know this, 1893, when 24-year-old uh, Mohandas Gandhi was thrown out of his first-class compartment in uh, Marisburg, South Africa, he sat humiliated and shivering in a dark waiting room. He thought to himself, I have three choices. I can forget what happened and just continue with my work, move on, humiliated, swallow my pride, or I can go back to India where everyone else looks like I do. Or I can stay and fight. Now Gandhi's introspection, when he explored his fears and motives and insecurities, was a defining experience. A very deeply creative experience for him. And a moment, a pivotal moment for the rest of the world. A moment which led to actions from which millions of us have benefited. The coming together of Gandhi's inner questioning and purposeful external action changed the world. So when the two worlds of curiosity, you can play around with the tippy top. Krishnamurti used to talk about the inward, the psyche as the tippy top. When the two worlds of curiosity, the outer and the inner come together, you have a revolutionary mind. A mind that lives in abiding curiosity, confidence in humanity, a mind that lives and acts creatively, a mind that acts with purpose and passion, 
That mind is yours. That mind is yours if you're alive and awake to the power and richness of being curious. If you welcome opportunities with uncertain outcomes and unknown outcomes. Right? If you tinker and explore in whatever you do, not only because you're looking for a result, be it fame or success or money or love or even liberation, but because you absolutely love and enjoy what you're doing, that process of discovery. It's a fundamental difference. Some of the greatest entrepreneurs even, since we're in a business school. The other day I was watching an interview with, uh, who was it? Elon Musk. The Tesla, Tesla man, Solar City, and SpaceX. And as he was describing his engagement with Tesla and the fact that he'd come very close to a nervous breakdown, somebody asked him about the return on investment. And of course, he had to address that question and all the rest of it. And then he said, look, I'm not doing this. I have to do it for an ROI, obviously, to make it sustainable. But that's not the driving factor. The driving factor is, I believe the world's going to run out of fossil fuels and I have to do something about it. The money and the rest of it is a byproduct of it. So it's a subtle shift and that's what leads to passion-based creativity. 5,100 years ago, a blind king told his chariot here. You may have heard of it. Dharma Kshetre Kuru Kshetre Samveta Yuyutsavaha Mamakaha Pandavas Chaiva Kimma Kurvata Sanjaya, Kimma Kurvata Sanjaya. O Sanjay, on the holy battlefield of Kurukshetra, tell me what my sons, the Kurus, and the sons of Pandu are doing. Now, I would submit that you, we, are at the crossroads of a similar make or break decision. You have a great responsibility. You talked about a new government, the potential that India has. You can't eat potential. You have a great responsibility. Like never before in our history, what you choose to do when you step out of this institute will have a profound effect on the rest of the world. Right? Because you are the world. Do you want to build a creative India? An India that's full of ideas, an India that innovates, an India that invents, an India that creates new models of learning, of business, social entrepreneurship, of politics, of sustainable and spiritual living? Or do you want to copy what someone else says or does? So as you step out of the IIM Bangalore and pursue your careers, elevate your vision. Go where no one's gone before. Inspire yourself through your unique mission and inspire your colleagues and friends and families as well. Sing and dance. Or create environments where singers and dancers like Rani and Roja and a young Ramanujan can flourish. Right? Find a tippy top and live the three A's. Ah, aha, and ha ha. Thank you very much. Chief guest for the evening, Mr. Ramji Raghun, Director Sushil Vachani, Dean of Academics, uh, Mr. Devnath Tirupati, distinguished alumni, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I'd like to congratulate all those who were recognized for their years of service to this great institution. I'd like to start by saying what a fascinating narrative that was on curiosity and creativity by our chief guest, which has certainly inspired and provoked a very new kind of thinking for all of us who have had the privilege of listening to our chief guest this evening. And I think it is very much in tune with what this institution stands for and what we are trying to do to create a new future for those in this country and those who are going to be fortunate enough to graduate from this great school of learning. I do believe that the whole national agenda of inclusive economic development 
is about creative thinking. It is about problem solving. It is about finding new solutions to the challenges that really confront us and have confronted us for all these decades. And I think for all of us who have been involved with the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, it is about scripting an agenda for IIMB that will shape not only the lives of those who graduate from these portals, but also shape the economic agenda for the country. I do believe that today we are poised at an inflection point in our economic development which is about finding new ways of doing things. We do know that the future is about doing very different things and doing things differently and what worked in the past need not necessarily work for solving our future problems. One of the big challenges that we have in this country is about governance. It's about finding new ways of governance and governing ourselves. And that's what management schools can do in terms of finding new models of governance for this country. When we talk about better governance and good governance, it is really about managing our resources better. It is about managing and shaping our policies better. And it is about managing and sustaining our environment better. So all this calls for new ways of thinking. All this calls for creative thinking. And all this calls for out-of-box thinking which will need your curiosity to be aroused. You will have to question, you will have to inquire, you will have to experiment and you will have to basically take bold challenges and bold decisions to solving some of these monumental problems that confront us. And I always believe that challenges create very exciting opportunities. After all, entrepreneurship is about facing challenges and converting challenges into opportunities. And it is the, that what is exciting and that is what I think our chief guest was also talking about. How do you look at problems and convert them into opportunities? How do you look at challenges and convert them into great economic development realities? I think that's what this whole country is about. That's what this institution is about and that's what entrepreneurship is about. I think today IIMB sees itself as a great platform for all the stakeholders that need to engage in inclusive economic development. The IIMB is a unique platform that brings together government, academia, and the private sector. And I think this is what the management ethos is about at the IIMB. Today, technology is transforming our lives in a big way. And I think knowing how to manage and understand technology is also another big challenge. We've already seen e-tailing completely change the way we think about retailing. And I think that itself brings in a very new way of managing logistics and managing the whole area of retailing. And I think this is an area certainly being in Bangalore, I think IIMB needs definitely to take a focus and leadership role in seeing how we manage this evolving space based on technology where Bangalore certainly has attained leadership globally. In keeping with the spirit, of course, you just heard from our director that MOOCs is going to be a very keen focus for this institution where we want to change the way learning and education is delivered in management uh, 
areas. We also, as a board, are very, very concerned and committed and sensitized about social needs, about social impact. And I think we certainly want to focus on social enterprise because I think that's another very urgent need for this country. How do we create business opportunities for various strata of society? You've just heard some amazing stories that our chief guest narrated in terms of getting young children in the villages to get excited about science get excited about applying science and technology to innovation and innovating new solutions. And I think it's our youth and our young who are going to really transform this country. We need to engage them and take responsibility and ownership of the challenges that we are posed with. In our very city of Bangalore and of course across the country we know that the Prime Minister has articulated his campaign for cleaning the country, Swachha Bharat campaign as he calls it. And we know that this campaign will only work if it starts right from the, ch the children. We have to teach this right from schools because trying to retrofit the mindset when people have grown up and attained adulthood is very, very difficult because habits die hard. And I think this is where I think finding solutions for some of the very simple but very grave problems that face us is where I think we can actually bring about very new ways of engaging people in building social businesses and creating wealth out of waste as we call it. So IIMB is very committed to engaging and, you know, igniting young minds to think about new ways of doing things, about doing something different, about not being too imitative but being more innovative. And I think this is the ethos that we want to basically see resonate amongst all those who leave the portals of this great learning institution. And so I think we had a very apt speaker this evening who really ignited our minds to look at the way we go about educating our young and educating our young minds to think innovatively. And I, for one, I'm convinced that unless we innovate and unless we focus on getting young minds to think innovatively, we will never be able to really come out of this mire of challenges that we are really faced with. So it is innovation that will win the day for India. And I think what is important for us to really, really recognize is the power of innovation that India has. And as somebody said, you know, I think uh, Das Narendra said that, you know, we've always talked about the potential, but you know, we can't eat potential. We've got to realize that potential. And in order to do that, I think we've got to really make innovation part of our DNA. And once we, you know, get to do that, I think uh, this country has a great future. So with that, I'd like to thank every one of you to be here on this Founda Founders Day and Foundation Day. And I thank every one of you for being here to celebrate the various awardees. And uh, I once again thank our chief guest, for delivering such an inspirational talk. Thank you very much.